Hi everyone. Today I want to have a look at optimistic updates with Blazor and GraphQL. So what are optimistic updates? Think about mutations like on Twitter, where I have the like button for a tweet. I don't want to wait for the server response for this mutation. I just want a very fluent UI there and update the state and everywhere this tweet is highlighted in my session. If you like our content, please hit the like and subscribe button below the video. And with this, let's dive in. So first, let's have a look at the website here. And I built a small website around cryptocurrencies. So you can see I have a couple of coins here. And what I can do here, for instance, is put one of these coins to my watch list. So by just clicking on here, I'm doing a mutation and this is getting into my watch list. And you can see when I click this, it just takes a couple of milliseconds, but you already can see there is some delay. Even worse, if we look at the developer tools here and uh, then switch to throttling, for instance, let's go for a slow 3G connection. So you're on your mobile device and you're trying out this page. And then you try to put, for instance, the Bitcoin here uh, out of your watch list. If I do that, you can see the network request and now it's through. Let me focus in on the fetch requests here and let's do that again. I'm clicking, you can see the network request takes a second and then we are done and Strawberry Shake updates the store. The reason for this is that we have an internal store and all the components here are subscribed to that store. So whenever we do a network interactions, fetch data from the network or update data, then we essentially do the network request wait for the result and with the result we update the store and then all the components are updated and that's cool because when I for instance go here to my Bitcoin you can see it's loading data but now this data is being loaded that is in my store and if I go back to my coin list put the Bitcoin again to the watch list Let's wait and go back to my Bitcoin overview here. You can see it's already in the watch list marked here because this component is also now updated from the store. Let me make that more clear. If I wipe that out and you can see I'm switching between my list and my Bitcoin overview, I have no network interaction because we are now serving the data from our store. Let's have a look at the code and then dive in deeper. So I have here my pages. You can see the index and the Bitcoin page. And if I go in the index page, you can see that I have here the use get assets. And that essentially is my get assets GraphQL query. You can see I'm fetching all the coins in my GraphQL server. And then I have here a special fragment index asset, which is all the data that I want for my grid in my page. If I go back to my page here, you can see it's a basic table here where I just render out my data. You can see that we have selected the strategy to use the cache first, meaning we do initially the network request. But as soon as the data is in our local client store, we will do no more network interaction to fetch new data. Second here is that I have here this toggle icon. And every time I toggle it, essentially, I'm mutating here depending on if my asset is in the watch list or not. So if it's in the watch list, then I remove it from the watch list and vice versa. So what we want to do is short circuit the update mechanism and update the store manually and then do the network request. Or we already could start the network request and then update the store immediately. To do that, we're going to inject a new service here. And that gives us access to the underlying store. For each client, we generate a specific store accessor. In our case, it's called the crypto client store accessor. So with this store accessor, I'm able to update or manipulate my store. Let's have a quick look at it. So the store accessor has essentially two stores, the entity store and the operation store. The operation store holds the operation results for, for instance, here, our get assets operation. And each operation result is made up of entities. So if we manipulate the entities, the operation store is being updated and the result is recreated from these new entities. And that will trigger the re-render of our components. So let's do that. 
So we're going to take the entity store here and then we are going to update it. You can see the entity store has a current snapshot here because the entity store is essentially immutable. It always holds just a snapshot of the latest updated entities. So in order to update it, we're going to create a new snapshot. And we do that by using this update method here, which will guarantee an atomic update to our store. So the update here is done with the delegate and the delegate provides us with a session. That is our update session. It allows us to interact, load data, but also create this new snapshot. So before we do anything else, we need an ID here, an entity ID to refer to the entity that we actually want to manipulate. So let's create that. We're going to create this entity ID here. And an entity ID in Strawberry Shake consists of a type name. In this case, it's asset because that is the name of the GraphQL type for this entity. The second thing is that we need an ID, but at the moment our index asset interface here doesn't have any ID. So we're gonna go back to our GraphQL query here, and then we're gonna add this ID to our fragment here. With this in place, we go back to our component, and now our asset has an ID and that we can just pass in here. With this, we can now fetch our entity and um, there is a chance that this entity is now null because uh, there could be a cache rule to get the cache emptied after a certain amount of time or whatever else happened here. So we're gonna make that safe and check if that entity exists. Only if that exists, we're gonna use it. So to update the entity, we're going to use the session and use this set entity method. And set entity is for adding entities or for updating entities. So in both cases, you just do set entity. And we're going to use our entity ID that we already have. And then we would need to recreate the entity. By default, the strawberry shake store is not being generated for use by us humans or by us developers. So it's made for efficiency. And that means the asset entity here is a class that we generated. And you can see we have to pass everything of this thing in through the constructor. So a better way here than using the constructors is actually changing our default settings. And we have here in the settings a section called records. And you can see entities are not by default generated as records, but we can change that to true. And then if we go back here, we actually can use the nice wither syntax. So we can say we want this entity, but we want this entity with is watch list being changed to the opposite of whatever is being set at the moment. So we're gonna take this and then we take the inverse of that. Awesome, this looks good. With that, we are essentially done. We have implemented the store update. We can go back to our website. You can see it's loading the data again. We go back to our coin list here. And now we do the same update as before. And in this case, I'm removing the Bitcoin of my list. If I click that, you can see immediately it's done. And then the network request is done. Let's do that again. I'm removing the Cardano here. And you can see it's immediately added to the watch list, not removed. And the network request takes a bit of time. And if I go here to my Bitcoin back, you can see it's not in the watch list. But now I go back here. Immediately, the network request is still waiting, but we already have it in my watch list and now the network request is also through. So you can build very nice reactive applications with that, even if you have bad network. There are other use cases to this. You could also create offline applications with this by hooking up a local database to the store and feeding essentially the changes that you have done to the database and then replay that to the backend as it becomes available again. But these are even more advanced topics that I will pick up at a later episode. I hope you liked this episode. It went for the more advanced use cases where you want to create really fast applications by leveraging the local store. If you want to help our project, please go to GitHub and give us a GitHub star. And with this, I'm out.